Oh, circle, circle, circle. I knew as soon as season one wrapped up that I wanted to analyze his character. He often ended up being the person discussed most after each episode. So what better way to deal with those brain worms than to put it into a video? That certainly seems to have been my approach to Arcane so far. From the moment he appeared in the dimly lit lab at the end of episode one, looking like someone who had just walked out the set of Bioshock's Rapture, I knew he was going to be an intriguing character to follow. My man was literally introduced in a dank, neon lit room under the sea dressed in a 1950s style fashion. I couldn't not connect the two dots. I've connected the two dots. You didn't connect shit, but- I've connected them. If you do enjoy what comes next, please subscribe and leave a little comment. Also, if you haven't seen my other Arcane videos, you should do that too. Talking about Silco naturally means talking about his relationship with Jinx, and while I will touch on that area, I'm not going to go into it super deeply because there are plenty of other videos out there on that subject that cover it really well. While there is no such thing that is absolute perfection, the craftsmanship behind Silco's character came pretty damn close. Let's dive in, shall we? In animation, there are three factors that can make or break a character. Vocal performance, character design, and how that character is physically animated. Silco is voiced by Jason Spazak, whose smooth, buttery voice is somehow both soothing to listen to and intimidating in the same breath. It's perfect casting, with Jason able to instill a sense of dread when the scene requires it, but also able to inject so much underlying emotion when Silco's usually calm demeanour slips. I've put together a selection of some of my favourite vocal performances into a little montage, and obviously major spoilers ahead. I never would have given you to them. Not for anything. Don't cry. And as prodigy, don't forget again. That's me! Half a dozen enforcers, dead! Enforcers, dead! Part of me wishes I could wipe my brain of arcane and experience this with fresh eyes and ears all over again. This performance translates into an extremely strong on-screen presence, with every bit of Silco's dialogue something you can't help but pay attention to. He chooses his words carefully at almost all times, often laced with an underlying threat. If Arcane was a play, Silco's the kind of character you would find your eyes drawn to even if he wasn't in the spotlight. However, it's not just how Silco sounds that makes him an instantly memorable character, it's his character design too. I could ramble on and on about how much I love the designs of so many of the characters in Arcane, but I'm trying to stay on course here. Silco dresses himself for success, wearing well-tailored, smart clothes more akin to a citizen of Piltover, but with his own trademark blacks and reds, distinguishing him as a person of power and importance to the audience and to his associates, who all dress a little bit more ragtag. Silco's deformed face, where he was permanently scarred by the polluted waters of the Undercity, is a lovely touch too. It's a constant reminder to the audience that yes, Silco's methods are extreme, but there is also something far, far wrong with the current status quo for civilians to be exposed to water so toxic that it does this to an exposed wound. It's a constant reminder for Silco too, who interestingly, unlike some other antagonists, doesn't cover the scarring with a mask. Maintaining a constant visual symbol of the significant inequality between Zon and Piltover. The most we actually see Silco cover up his scarring is with some kind of concealer, which has some excellent coverage actually, but the scarring is still visible. Silco, my guy, do you mind DMing me where you got this stuff? That is some impressive coverage for all of those imperfections. The final thing I want to discuss in this section is Silco's physicality, which really comes down to how he is animated by the Arcane team. He's the kingpin of Zon during Act 2 and 3, so naturally he holds himself with poise and authority you would expect from a leader, whilst instilling fear. It's rare that this demeanour slips. We see this most often around his scenes with Jinx, where the emotional mask cracks slightly. However, what I really loved about Silco's physicality over the course of the season was how Silco could, when pushed, go absolutely feral, allowing that monstrous and predatorial side to rule his behaviour. This is particularly obvious when Vi and Caitlin drop a building on him. We see Silco go from this reverent, almost biblical figure as he hands out Shimmer to the misfortunate, with his disciples behind him, to a desperate and unhinged individual, frothing at the mouth and barely able to keep on his feet because of how furious he is. It makes him terrifying and unpredictable in a way that feels realistic and very human. Silco appears to understand, more so than any other character in the series, the power of fear and the fear of power. 
If that sounded confusing, let me break that down slightly. Silco recognises that fear is an incredibly powerful motivator in getting people and society at large to bend to his wishes. Those wishes being an independent Undercity at whatever cost, with one exception. It's why he rules the Undercity with an iron fist and is able to maintain his leadership for many years, suffocating any chance of rebellion against his rule from those that were still loyal to Vander's ideals. He also believes that fear of the Undercity in Piltover will eventually be enough for Topside to cut their losses and sever ties to the Undercity, allowing Silco's dream of Zon to become a reality. He is quick to sense this fear in Jace. Fear of more death if Topside continues to interfere with Silco's business, which allows Silco to almost, almost get the perfect diplomatic resolution. However, fear alone is not enough. Silco also recognises that in order to rule the Undercity, he has to motivate that society with something other than fear. Power. The power of Shimmer. Shimmer is practically a miracle drug, able to allow a person to survive fatal wounds and significantly increase their physical abilities. Life under Silco's regime allows citizens of the Undercity to feel far above their rotten luck in life, even for brief periods of time. This Shimmer Addicted Man we see in both Act 1 and 2 sums it up quite nicely. Shimmer? Why would you take something that does that to you? I just wanted to feel what it was like to be somebody, to make other people afraid. It's no surprise that this stuff is so addicting and so hard for people to give up. Basically, as long as Silco runs the Undercity, they will have access to Shimmer. That is a very powerful motivator for obedience and compliance, which lines up quite well with the carrot and stick ideology of running a society, where reward and punishment coexist to achieve a desired behaviour. What makes using Shimmer a particularly cunning move from Silco is that it not only keeps the Undercity citizens compliant, it also only helps to increase the fear of the Undercity from Piltover, further alienating its citizens from one another two birds with one stone. Silco himself also sees beauty within the monstrous and the powerful. Beautiful, aren't they? They're monsters. There's a monster inside all of us. You see, power, real power, doesn't come to those who are born strongest, or fastest, or smartest. No. It comes to those who will do anything to achieve it. With this kind of ideology, it's not really surprising that Silco seems very at ease with the negative effects of Shimmer. Shimmer elevates the weak and taps into that primitive power. Basically, there are so many layers to how Silco uses fear and power to achieve his dreams that you could probably make a big old cake out of it. This title also applies to the previous section a little, because much of what Silco does is expert manipulation on a societal level. However, what really makes Silco an excellent villain is how he is able to manipulate others on a very personal level. Silco makes a point of knowing what others hold dear so that he can use them for his own means and ends. When he starts to sense that Enforcer Sheriff Marcus may be starting to waver no matter how much coin he throws at him, Silco instead targets his daughter in what is probably one of my favourite Silco scenes in the series. This play was both a reminder to Marcus of what might happen should he not take care of those ends again, and also to reinforce that no amount of security will keep Silco from targeting a person should he choose to. The only way to protect yourself from Silco is loyalty to Silco. I know there are lots and lots of thoughts about Silco's relationship with Jinx, which is by design extremely complex and layered, but it's quite clear that he also manipulated her. Silco believed Vi was dead for many years, but when Vi reappears, he knows that this will cause considerable issues for his relationship with Jinx. Again, Silco knows what others hold dear. He knows that regardless of how jaded that Jinx is with regards to her sister, there's a chance that Vi may still be able to get through to her. It's why he lies about Vi's reasons for being in the Undercity. Powder! I'm here for you! Only you! You can fire that thing if you want, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to abandon you again. But you found out she came back. You lied. I wanted to protect you. From what? She and the Enforcer are back for the crystal. Not for you. It's also why he tries to have Vi killed before she gets the chance to reunite with Powder, to avoid any chance of reconciliation between the two sisters. 
Another key way that Silco manipulates his associates is through fairly brutal reminders of why they fight for what they fight for. In another standout Silco scene, Silco exposes the other gang leaders in the Undercity to toxins from its minds, enough to have them begging on the floor for mercy. Silco has elevated all of these people to positions of power and privilege, not far from a life that they might find in Piltover. With that elevation has come arrogance and complacency. They've forgotten what it's like to be at the very bottom rung of society. That's why using this toxin is such a brilliant move on Silco's part, creating a very practical showcase of that arrogance. These people have spent so much time away from all of the toxic air of the Undercity that they almost immediately start choking on it, choking on the privilege Silco effectively gave them. I particularly love that Silco barely seems affected by the toxins, certainly in comparison to everyone else. It's a reminder to the audience that Silco truly has experienced the worst sides of life in the Undercity, and is still regularly exposed to the same poisonous air that his citizens are to be somewhat resistant to its effects. Silco isn't someone fighting ruthlessly for change from a high tower, he's still living amongst it. This makes him even more compelling as an antagonist. He could have settled for a comfortable life like the rest of his associates, but instead still actively pursues systematic change, even if it's to his own detriment. Loyalty ironically manages to be both Silco's biggest flaw and strength, and it makes sense. The Silco we grow to know in the show is one that was shaped by betrayal by Vander, who was once his brother by shared ideals. Since that fateful day, Silco has required absolute loyalty from those around him. He doesn't want to repeat the same mistakes that Vander made that allowed Silco to rise to power in the first place. Silco ensures this loyalty in a number of ways, which goes back to the carrot and stick ideology I mentioned earlier in the video. Silco promises reward for loyalty from his followers, and severe punishment for those that falter. We also see this play out in chilling detail with Savika when Silco's underlings plot to overthrow him, requiring Silco's right hand to deal the killing blow to her boss. It's an ultimate test of loyalty, with Silco quite literally putting his neck on the line when the moment comes. Though this was incredibly dangerous, Silco is able to ensure Savika's loyalty in the days to come. The possible usurpers to Silco's throne are severely dealt with. Their ringleader Finn is killed and his ally punished. Well, she would have been if Jace hadn't already shot-potted her son to an early grave already. However, something that I find really interesting about Silco is that his loyalty goes both ways, even at the cost of his dream. When Jace offers Silco basically everything that he has ever wanted for Zon, Silco can't go through with it because it would mean handing over Jinx, who he now sees as a daughter, as his own family. It would make him no better than Vander, who was also willing to cut ties with family for what he believed in. He cannot betray Jinx for his cause, even though we've seen him willing to do anything else to achieve his goals, and I find that both painful and brilliant writing. I had a lot of fun with this video, and I hope you did too. Silco is probably one of the more divisive characters in the show, and people enjoy his presence for a whole host of different reasons. That's what comes with such a complex and intriguing character. These were just some of my own thoughts and opinions. If you haven't had a chance to, please check out my other arcane analysis videos. I've heard they're pretty okay. And make sure to leave a comment and subscribe if you want more of this type of content. I've got more video ideas that I'm throwing around at the moment, but it's nice to have a little trilogy of arcane videos now on the channel. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great new year.